Thank you, Professor Borelli. It is my honor to introduce our first speaker today, Lee Dunbar, currently serving as the Assistant Director of the Planning and Standards Division of the Connecticut DEP Water Protection and Land Reuse Bureau, supervising scientific and technical staff responsible for implementing a number of water management activities. Recently, he has been assigned lead responsibility to oversee the development of stream flow regulations in Connecticut, which is directly applicable to his talk on the reconciliation of water needs of society with the water needs of wildlife here in Connecticut. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you. It was a good job on the introduction. I'll have to have you write my next uh, resume or something if I need to go looking for a job. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to start off this morning with, uh, with a little bit of history. Um, I got up this morning around 6, uh, ran down to the barn, gave each of the horses about five gallons of water and two quarts of grain. Flake of hay, came back up, gave a little water to the dog, took a shower, made coffee. And so you can see by probably by 7, 7.30, I was in the game. I think probably you guys were all in the game too. Uh, I noticed they hammered the coffee pretty good out there. So uh, this issue of water is one that affects everybody. And, and I think we uh, are all aware of that if we ever step back and think about it. And my uh, discussion this morning is going to focus basically on one term, one word. If there's one word to take away from my presentation today, it's balance. Because that's what we've been endeavoring to do with regard to Connecticut's uh, proposed stream flow regulation or flow standards is to balance. Balance the needs of humans, each of us, every day, uh, with the biological or ecological needs uh, for water. So. Keep that in mind as, as we move forward. I'll, I'll uh, get a bunch of slides here. We'll have a little discussion and then uh, uh, some time for questions at the end. Hopefully we'll have some good questions um, from this group. <clears throat> this is a, a picture. Perhaps you've even seen this before. This is the Fenton River. I know that uh, Professor Warner gave a, a discussion yesterday on Yukon's efforts out there. This is what's known as not just a, a, a dry stream bed, but a desiccated stream bed, and it results from overpumping of some wells uh, just upstream, or shall we say at this point, up channel from this location. Uh, this was something that, that happened. Uh, it didn't necessarily have to happen, but it did. And I think there are agreements in place, much to the credit of the university and also DEP, uh, to make sure that this never happens again in this particular situation. Um, but a statewide regulation is designed to ensure that we don't have other uh, similar instances occurring at other locations. But uh, this is about as bad as it gets for, for us in Connecticut when you have a, a dry stream bed such as this uh, of this magnitude. I would like to sort of lay out sort of the regulatory framework or the timeline. Um, back around 1970, the legislature originally uh, put into place a stream flow act that was designed primarily to protect the state's investment in stocked fish. In other words, we would stock, DEP would stock streams, and then we wanted to make sure that those, that investment in trout primarily was, was uh, maintained. So the, the initial act only covered streams that were stocked by the state. It took us about almost 10 years to get the first regulation in place. Uh, 1982, we got a um, program in place to um, deal with permitting and registering diversions uh, or extractions of water. And then there was a program review in 2003 to see how we were doing. Right around that time, there were also two other things that happened. One, there was a very significant lawsuit between citizens in Washington, Connecticut versus Waterbury. 
uh, relative to water in the Chapag River. Um, and then the, also the Fenton River, the situation that was, I just showed you, also occurred in 2005. That got everybody fired up. And so we got a new law uh, in 2005 mandating DEP to develop stream flow regulations. Uh, we formed some advisory groups and we now have a draft regulation uh, here in 2009. I'd like to stress that what I'll be talking about in terms of a stream flow regulation for Connecticut is a proposal. It is not yet promulgated uh, and it, uh, we're very hopeful that it will move forward, but it is not a done deal at this point. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, we may need your support down the road to make sure that that happens. The new public act uh, directs the commissioner of DEP, and this is very important, this is a stream, flow, or water uh, statute, but the authority was given to DEP to develop that. That's the environmental side. So again, we're looking at balancing here, but nevertheless, the legislature decided that DEP was the one who would perform this balancing between ecological and, and human needs. A couple of things about it. It was going to apply to all rivers and streams, not just stock streams. Uh, they threw in the bit about best available science. Um, we are to preserve and protect natural aquatic life. DEP has been, that's a big part of our mission. And promote and protect public recreation, also central to DEP's mission. But some other things were thrown in to be based on natural flow, natural variation in flow. We hardly endorse that approach. But we also need to provide for the needs of public health and flood control, industry, public utilities, water supply, safety, agriculture, and other lawful uses. There's, the, there's sort of the kicker. Um, we were supposed to do this by December 2006. Obviously, we are running a little late. So here's a, just a couple clips from the statute itself. Flow regulations preserve and protect aquatic life contained in such waters and then providing for the needs and requirements of, as I just mentioned, all the lawful uses of such water. The uh, little graphic in the middle here, uh, for those of you who may be familiar with the Federal Clean Water Act, which is a water quality statute, speaks to the physical, chemical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. Flow is probably the principal physical factor that is necessary to maintain the integrity of this system, which uh, involves both the biological component, the living component, chemical quality, and physical habitat. So it fits right into this particular model of how, how um, water resources should be managed. So how do we start with this balancing? The first thing we did is we needed to get some help because while DEP is quite expert in many of the natural resource management type activities, we have less experience and knowledge on, for example, how water utilities operate their businesses or some of the other concerns, agriculture, um, for example, and, and other, other concerns. So we formed some advisory groups, um, a broad-based umbrella group for the commissioner, a scientific and technical group, and a policy, policy work group. And very quickly, I just sort of like to give you the flavor of how this balancing took place. Here's the commissioner's group. Betsy Wingfield is our bureau chief. She was the chair of this group. Um, and for those who are, of you who are not uh, familiar with the acronyms here, uh, EPA is on this. DPUC are the people who set the water rates. So if you want, uh, for, uh, for certain utilities, decide how much they can charge for, for water. Fisheries Council. DPH is the Department of Public Health. They deal with water quality for drinking primarily, that's a big part, and quantity, adequate supplies of high quality water, that's their mission. CBIA is the uh, Connecticut Business and Industry Association. Water is important to them. Obviously the Farm Bureau, uh, USGS, the Geological Survey, they are uh, the foremost experts in the world really with regard to hydrology and, and, and uh, water issues. Um, South Central Regional Water Authority, they are a water supplier. TNC, Mark Smith is here today. He'll be talking, uh, I believe, right after me. Uh, the Nature Conservancy, a law, law professor from UConn, 
And Lynn Werner is a uh, representative of the Environmental Advocacy Group. HVA is the Housatonic Valley Authority. On our science side, we have four, four folks from DEP, Peter Erstad and Rick Jacobson are both in our fisheries division. Uh, Bob Gilmore is in our inland water resources division. They permit diversions. And the reason that I'm on this is that they were looking for someone who hadn't yet heard that it was impossible to do this task. Um, so I got stuck with that job. And again, there are uh, some people here. The technical side has got a couple of um, Doug Thompson, obviously from Connecticut College. You probably most know him. Uh, Glenn Warner spoke yesterday. He's a uh, professor at UConn. Um, again, someone from Connecticut Water Company and a, and a uh, consultant, Malona McBroom, who deal with a lot of um, evaluations for water utilities. So again, a very broad-based group. And on the policy side, the same type of, of deal. Um, Rob LaFrance is in the commissioner's office. He deals with our legislative stuff. And again, a number of people, um, some folks like Kurt Malin from Trout Unlimited, or Rivers Alliance, those are our advocacy groups, uh, but also people from Connecticut Water Company and the regional water authorities to provide balance because we wanted to hear from a lot of different people and this worked out very well. We got exceptionally good participation and we had uh, many, many uh, discussions on how we can best balance this program. So we finally settled on a structure and it really has three components. One, a classification system, which I'll talk about first. Some operational rules, uh, which depend on what class a certain water body or segment of a water body is placed into. And very importantly, we, we spent a lot of time talking about adequate time for compliance because we made a commitment very early on that we were not going to be overly disruptive to the water business because everybody needs water and we don't want to interrupt the supply. In fact, that's that would be perhaps the worst possible outcome of regulation is if it created situations where people did not get the water that they need when they need it. Um, so first, to talk about the framework, a classification, a little bit of biology here for any ecologists in the room that should be familiar to you. This is what's known as the biocondition gradient. It's a very robust model. It applies to very many different situations. On the left axis, the vertical axis, you have conditions from a natural state to a degraded state. And then across the bottom, a stress gradient from a low stress to a very high stress. It could be anything you want. In this case, we're looking at water quantity. It could be toxics. It could be any aspect of a uh, stress on a community. But as stress goes up, the biological condition deteriorates, and you can see that on this curve, there are uh, various levels and what takes place. You have a natural condition and as things get worse, you lose sensitive species. Some taxa disappear, but you keep the function for a while. Things, you know, they, they sort of trade places, but eventually you get to a point where uh, things are unacceptable towards the far right of the graph. Interpreting this relative to stream flow tells us that not all the streams are the same. Uh, that's fairly intuitively obvious. It's also not possible uh, to take everything back to a pristine condition. Um, we're accepting that. And that different places on that curve call for different sorts of management strategies in order to be effective. The challenge is to determine what to do at various points on the curve, how to, how to, how to address this issue, what goes where. So we simplified it a little bit. This is the same graph. Uh, and we are proposing four classes of streams. Class one would be a natural flow condition, rivers for river fish, or if you prefer, fluvial specialists, species that require flowing water for most of their lifestyle and they are highly dependent on it. And then in class two, you've got some alteration, still very, very natural, of, of high quality, uh, rivers for some river fish. So some flu fluvial specialists, but not exclusively. And then class three, uh, which many people call working rivers, which either means working from the standpoint of they're, they're doing something useful for people, or conversely, working means they're still functional in terms of ecological use. But rivers for some fish. 
basically we're going to have fish, we're going to have many uses of water in these class three streams. And then finally class four, where we're really not, we're sort of off the bottom of the, of the chart. So we've got four different classes ranging from exceptionally high conditions in class one to uh, perhaps degraded conditions, which are, are um, in some cases, we may not be able to mitigate. I'm very quickly going to run through some slides to sort of give you an idea how we're going to proceed with this. Um, students in the audience, I would uh, just like to give you a little tip here. Uh, my view from the management side at a state agency who deals with resource management is that one of the things that is most useful and should be continue to be increasingly useful uh, for you if you want to have a career in this area is the ability to do geospatial analysis. It appears to be this is the, the way to handle massive amounts of data and to deal things uh, on a very large scale. We're, we're finding this to be hugely useful to us, uh, and we use GIS uh, quite frequently for our most difficult problems. This is a watershed with the, the, the it happens to be the Saugatuck, but it's just an example, um, and it shows the, uh, the streams in blue. And some of the things we can do is we can look at where the diversions are, where water's being taken out, surface, groundwater, and then we can look at where stream reaches may be affected by those diversions. Obviously, it's a, a focus of what we're looking at, um, but also impervious cover. Uh, the, the sort of pinkish areas are areas where impervious cover is over 5%. And once you get beyond 5%, then you start to be seeing some impacts of impervious cover on the hydrologic cycle. Uh, higher highs due to flashy runoff and less recharge to maintain base flows during dry conditions. So these are some of the kinds of data overlays that we'll be looking at to determine what the classification should be. So we might do something like, say, these could be class ones because they have uh, low impervious cover and no diversions. And then, oh, we found something here which looks like it may be a problem. Uh, for some reason, so we would take those into account. Twos and threes, a little diff difficult to uh, distinguish and how we're going to sort those, but nevertheless, if you look again at where the diversions are, maybe something like this might be proposed, and so that ultimately when you put it all together, you would get a classification. This is just to illustrate how we might go forward with that. Um, but here's the sort of the framework, the schematic. Consider the factors that affect streams, affect flow in the stream. Things like diversions, obviously, dams, impervious cover, and return flow. Those are four biggies, but then also unique factors like do we have populations of native brook trout that require um, near or natural or near natural conditions? Are there water utilities that have, have informed us that they have plans to meet future needs by drawing water from certain areas. We'll need to take that into account and make sure that they have access to those if it's appropriate. Uh, other factors, what about conservation areas? Are there areas where people have, uh, local towns have designated as open space or for recreation? There are a number of unique factors, but ultimately DEP is gonna take it on the chin. We'll go forward and propose some stream flow classifications to the public, and we will have some feedback from the public, from people that use the water, local town officials, individual members of the public, hopefully. We want to have a debate. How do you want us to divide up the water? How do you want us to balance the use? What streams to class one, what streams to class three? And we will take comment on this over a period of time. And at the end of that period, after the debate uh, is completed, we will adopt stream flow classifications and what stream flow class you are in will determine how that resource will be effectively managed in the future. And frequently we get con uh, questions is does the class represent the current condition or does it represent a goal? And my usual answer to that is yes. Um, if in fact the current condition is what we'd like to sustain and maintain, then it represents the current condition. If it represents something that we'd like to either make better or allow to degrade, then it represents a goal. 
But either way, it becomes sort of the objective for managing and establishes the standard for that particular piece of water. This is going to be a huge project. We need to do the entire state, and we're looking, we're thinking it'll take us about five years. We may start here, actually, with the Thames Basin, um, which is fairly large, but we're thinking that we may go east to west and start with the, with the Thames Basin. So if this gets promulgated, uh, I may be back. So how do these rules affect how you do uh, actually manage a reservoir such as this or uh, your operation? Again, a little bit of science here. This is a hydrograph, uh, mean monthly flows across the year. You see across the bottom, January to November. Um, on the left axis, discharge in cubic feet per second. And in the blue is the mean. Uh, so you can see that during the early parts of the year, there's quite a bit of water around on average. And then during the late summer, not so much. What we've done is we have divided the year into six bio periods. This is because from an ecological standpoint, you need more water in the stream at certain times of the year than others. Species have evolved to deal with this variability. We want to maintain it. So for example, in the habitat forming period, which is where we are right now, you expect some high flows because the snow is melting up north. You get some rain, hopefully, and you need those high flows to move the gravel around. Um, as they say, you need the two-year flood to move the mud. You've got to clean them up. It maintains the habitat and, and keeps connects streams with their riparian floodplains. A lot of good things go on during the habitat forming period, but they don't happen if you don't have any water coming down the channel. Um, for those who are not biologists, clupeids are herrings. Um, in the June period, you've got resident species spawning. And then importantly, July through October is the rearing and growth period. You need to survive the summer. Summer is when it's dry. Aquatic life needs to make it through the summer. It's unfortunate that that's when people also want to use all the water for watering lawns, filling swimming pools, washing cars, in addition to their normal use. So human demand is high, and ecological demand is high, and flows are low. That's kind of the pinch point. And then our salmonid species, the trouts, spawn in the fall. Interesting also beyond this is if you look at the red at the bottom, that's the 95th percentile. And that is there specifically to show that although on an average year or an average situation you might have the blue, there are years and they're not that infrequent when you, all you've got is the red. And that's when things get really tight. And as I'm um, fond of telling people when it comes to aquatic life or any other kind of life for that matter, you can only kill things one time. So that if you kill them once, that's usually enough. Um, and you need, to, you need to keep that in mind, that it, a, an event which happens once in a while, but has that kind of an impact, can be as, just as serious, if not more so, than when you have sort of long-term chronic stress. So we have to manage for both the, the rare event and the common, uh, common situation. So there are two ways that you influence, at least two ways, um, beyond the impervious cover uh, situation, that we influence directly rivers, uh, flow in rivers and streams, and those are dams and, and withdrawals. Now this is a picture of the, um, res the uh, reservoir across in Willimannock. Uh, it's an uh, Army Corps of Engineer dam for flood control. Um, so, but it's there to illustrate that if you were to look and want to see how much flow was in that stream below the dam, it's quite obvious. The flow in the stream below the dam is totally dependent on how much water you let go through the dam, over, under, or around the dam. All the water in the stream, that's, is controlled by the dam. That's what they do. So for a stream below a dam, how much goes through the dam, how much you release is the key. Now here's a situation, another a groundwater well. And groundwater wells influence flows primarily in two ways. One, they intercept groundwater before it gets to the stream. 
or in some situations they can induce infiltration back from the stream to the well, in effect taking water directly out of the stream channel. So how much water is in the stream in this situation depends on how much you take out. So there's a very, from a technical side, it's very different. One is how much you let loose, how much you release from a dam, but for a well it's how much you take out. So that became the basis of our next, um, next movement. And I'm going to talk a little bit again about the balancing here. Um, these are some provisions in the reg that attempt to do that and attempt to ease the pain, if you will, of implementing um, an activity that has gone on since this area was populated and now there's sort of another layer on top in terms of how it's regulated. If you're doing something now, you've got to keep doing it. Okay, we're, we're sort of jumping in midstream. If you've got a permit or an agreement, you keep doing that. Uh, they may get it revised at some point in the future if they need to, but for now, you just follow that. And we also took some things off the table. Tidal rivers like the Thames out here, uh, that's off the table. Any dam that just does run a river, in other words, what comes in goes out, they're off the table and very small and intermittent withdrawals because they really don't have that much of an effect and, and really is not necessary to overreach and try to regulate everything. Uh, contrary to popular belief, um, DEP has no interest whatsoever in controlling everything that goes on in the world. Uh, we would, however, uh, like to, to manage some things um, and hopefully with as little effort as possible on our part. So there is some timing. Uh, and this is kind of how it's spaced out. Um, once we adopt the reg, the first five years, DEP will, will be working on classifying streams, uh, collecting data from both people that use water and, and, and manage water, and an analysis. This is um, a very necessary step due to the magnitude of what needs to happen in beginning in year five which is there's sort of an intermediate first cut, some intermediate release rules, and wells will be looked at as if they are in isolation. In other words, you take care of your problem and we'll worry about what your neighbor's contribution is to that problem uh, later. And then finally at year 10, um, we get into a, a situation where the final rules kick in and we're looking for collective cumulative compliance, everyone in a watershed, to have a cumulative lack of impact or cumulative compliance with the stream flow regulation. So it's spaced out over quite an extensive period of time. Um, however, there is an option to develop a local plan, a water management plan, or an agreement in a watershed by the local communities and the local users that can be in put in place at any time. So that is a key feature and we're hoping a lot of people will solve this problem for us, present us with a reasonable solution so we can endorse it and we can get on with life and everyone will be hopefully happier than they would be otherwise. Um, I mentioned sort of the intermediate level. This is what we call the low level release rule. And because you need different amounts of water in the stream at different times of the year, there is a different minimum required release from dams at different times of the year. And you can see we are dealing with the, um, these Q values are flow statistics. Q95 is the flow that's exceeded 95% uh, of the time in that particular bio period. Um, Q80 is the flow that's exceeded 80% of the time. So there's different amounts of water in different times of the year. After 10 years, we go to a multi-level release rule where if you are in the midst of a wet period, you release more water. If you are in the midst of a dry period, you release less water. That is an attempt to reflect seasonal, short-term variability, again, natural variation in flows, we're trying to reflect that as best we can, but yet balancing that with the reality that a water utility cannot go out currently and it just flows on a daily instantaneous basis. It's technically feasible, but it's really not practical right now. Making an adjustment every two weeks is, we think, a reasonable, um, sort of compromise between mimicking the natural hydrograph exactly on a day-to-day -day basis 
and only having a flat release for long periods of time. Uh, again, it's a part of the balancing activity. Here you can see what the hydrograph actually looks like. The gray at the bottom is actually the same hydrograph I showed you before. It's just a different vertical scale. But if you superimpose the daily values, you get to see how variable flow really is um, at this particular site. So just to see how this would affect an individual, this is the multi-level release rule. Here's stream flow for a year. And this is what it would look like if you applied the release. So you can see the release, which is the red at the bottom, is really not as variable. Again, this would be class three. Um, is not as variable as the actual flow. And it does provide quite a bit of water. The water that's in the blue is water that's available for use. Now the problem is, is in order to use that water, you need it when you need it. And you have to have some storage someplace to keep this water until you need it. If you don't have storage, this could provide, present some real problems to a water utility. Um, typical year, 12 adjustments. But we're going to take a closer look at that rearing and growth bio period. So this is the same data. We just changed the scale again, brought it into, into line. Here's the actual stream flow. Um, information. Now what we have, how this works, you see the red squares. Those represent 14 day median flow. So you look back 14 days, get the median. If that median flow is above the trigger, which is the dashed line, then you make a wet release. If the median flow for the previous 13 day, 14 days indicates it's been dry, you make a dry release. And you proceed to do that. And this is how much you release under these conditions. So if you had this hydrograph, you would have to make adjustments. And the water below the purple diamonds must be released. And the water above the purple diamonds is available for use. Um, but you, as you can see, right around September 9th, there's not a lot of water for use on that day. So again, without storage, uh, there are some issues. But these, again, is the release rule and hopefully there will be capacity behind the dam that can, that can both provide for release and provide for human use. Uh, that is the, the, the hope and expectation. So again, it looks something like this. For the rearing and growth bio period, the water in red gets released and the water in blue is available for use. But again, as I mentioned, that September 9th, you could have some problems if you're relying on instantaneous flow to, to provide for your supply. So in this case, there were five adjustments that were required. So 26 times a year, you have to decide whether to do a dry or a wet flow release. Many times there will be no change, but you've got to take a look. And here are the numbers on this chart. Um, and again, there's sort of a, a summary of how this is implemented. If you look at class three, existing practice for five years, low level trigger, for five to 10 years, and then going out to the 10th year, you start the multi-level release. There are some drought triggers that allow you to further reduce the amount that you uh, put through the dam um, if you are in a, a severe drought situation. Um, but I want to take a minute and look at quickly at the groundwater rule. Um, again, five years out, you got some data recording, maybe some modeling to do, um, looking at each well field individually, um, the amount that you can alter stream flow, not the amount that you can take out of the well, because there is some lag time, there is some storage in the aquifer, but the amount that you can alter stream flow is for class three, for example, 50% of the 99th percentile flow during that critical rearing and growth period during other times of the year when there may be more water around you get to multiply that times a factor uh, the infamous F factor that allows you to take out more during say the overwinter period than you would during the rearing and growth period. Um, same numbers the difference being 10 years out we need to look cumulatively so that if we have a series of diversions on a stream that they don't collectively cause a problem. Uh, and again, here are the, the uh, 
the, the numbers. So what are we looking for people to do during the first five years? We need to make sure that we can make the reductions physically. There are some reservoirs that don't have adequate release mechanisms. Valves need to be, be fixed or new equipment may need to be installed. Some monitoring equipment, we need to train some people to handle this. We've got to come up with some operational rules that make sense uh, to maximize yield for human use while making these releases. Many water utilities have a number of different sources. They need to balance how those sources are used in a, in a thoughtful way. And we need to deal with demand management. We have to find better ways to conserve water during drought periods so that we don't have to dry up streams in order to have green lawns, for example. And then we have to compensate for any reduction in supply. And again, things like water loss, demand management, interconnections between systems, using water for what is best suited, like recycling water if we can, um, bringing new supplies online if we need to, and perhaps even building some new treatment if that becomes absolutely necessary. Um, we're moving forward. We hope to have our uh, regulation out for comment sometime early this year. Uh, we'll be doing some outreach. <coughs> it's a huge job for us to classify all these streams. We're going to need a lot of help. And then we also have to, have to construct a data management system to handle the information so we can do the modeling that we need to do. And we got to look at our own house, make sure that our dams, state owns about 300 dams, we need to make sure that we're also in compliance with our own rules. So that basically concludes uh, my slides, um, and I'd be more than happy to, uh, to take any comments or questions that, uh, that anyone has.